Hello and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and I want to thank you for joining me here today. This is episode number 297, and today will be one of my solo episodes. I haven't done one of those for a while. I'm going to be talking about Compassion 101, why we are failing and how to do better. And this is really inspired. I've been lately reading a book entitled Compassion, Bridging Practice and Science, edited by Tanya Singer and Matthias Bowles. So some of these thoughts are inspirations that I got while reading that book and feeling like this is really an important topic for us to discuss right now. Before I dive into it, I just want to say a quick thank you to my two latest supporters on Patreon, Stephanie Elkins and Claire Murphy-Jones. Thank you so much for joining the team and contributing monthly to help keep the podcast on the air. I will mention, um, for those of you who are Patreon supporters, I just came out last week with the end of life news update for the month of April, and you'll find that on the Patreon page for supporters. So that's one of the bonuses you get as a supporter is I make this monthly summary, I guess, of things that are happening in the news around end of life issues. So I read lots of journal articles and studies and uh, things from the, the popular media relating to end of life. And I just summarize all those in kind of a 30 minute little audio for you to listen to. So You can keep up with what's happening, what's new in the end of life field, but also maybe find resources that might be helpful to you in your own work. So that's one of the bonuses you get. Another bonus that I keep promising is to do more movie reviews. I started doing movie reviews with my husband, Dr. Larry George, and we kind of lost our impetus for it and but I think we'll get back there we actually have a few movies that we've been watching that we've said oh my gosh we have to do reviews of this so I hopefully we're going to be doing some movie reviews again soon for our patreon supporters so anyway if you're interested in learning more about that you can go to my page at patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash e-o-l-u that's where you'll find out how to sign up and join our team and and thanks again to everyone who's been been such so faithful at supporting the podcast for the last four years or so. So now I want to dive into this topic of compassion. I have talked about compassion a couple of times in the past, but for some reason right now it feels really urgent to me that we all sit down and think about compassion a little bit more and actually take some steps to cultivate more compassion in our own lives, simply because of the state our world is in right now. And, you know, you don't have to look too far around you to see the effects of this pandemic that we've experienced globally for the past year, all of the loss of life, but also losses of employment and social connectedness. Many businesses um, have have closed down in the past year. Our communities look different than they used to. Things feel different to us. And in many ways, we have lost our cohesiveness, I feel, as a society. We've lost our sense of feeling that we're all in this together. We're here for one another. And I really believe it's important and critical right now that we regain some of our sense of compassion and caring for one another. When I look around, I see a lot of angry people. I see anger all over on social media and people freely expressing it toward one another. Um, We know that our society is very polarized politically, but also religiously and just in our worldviews, how we see the world and how we see what's happening to us. There are hate crimes on the rise. We've seen unbelievable police brutality over the past several months. Um, We're seeing 
a horrific number of deaths happening in India right now due to coronavirus and all of us feel terribly helpless to do anything about that. So there's so much suffering everywhere and and not to mention also the planet itself is suffering. Um, Climate change continues and and we're seeing the effects of species dying off uh, and we are appear to be entering another great extinction from what scientists are telling us. There's just there's suffering happening all around us and yet it feels like we don't have as much compassion as we need right now to help us get through this difficult time. And that's one thing I wanted, one reason why I wanted to talk about it today. I'm going to be reading some poetry today. Uh, if you listen regularly, you'll know I've been, I've been saying for the last year or so, I've really been into poetry. I've been, and um Oh, finding it really meaningful and really inspiring to me to read poetry. So I have several poems I'm including today in this talk. Um, so it is what you might call a kind of a touchy-feely talk. And um, I hope you'll listen to it all and hope that you'll find some sort of inspiration here. So the first poem that I want to read, I've read before, I can't remember when, um, but, but I did, I have done something on um, kindness in the past. So I might have read this poem for that podcast too, but I just love it. It really touches me. It's called Small Kindnesses by Danusha Lamaris. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by, or how strangers still say bless you when someone sneezes a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it to smile at them and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire, only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. So this poem, I I just find it so sweet. It touches me so much talking about the simplest little kindnesses that we can show one another in our lives. And yet one of the things I think many of us have experienced in the past year due to the pandemic is that we have become more isolated. We're not going out in public. We're not being around other people as much, or we haven't been. That's starting to change now. But also because of fears about being too close to one another, about touching someone else, uh, about even conversing with another person and being in their airspace, uh, we we are holding ourselves separate from others and it's interfering with how we show kindness to one another. I really believe that. So today I want to talk about how do we overcome some of that? How do we get back to a place of kindness and compassion, even if we're not quite ready to to go back to the way we interacted socially before. We're not ready to shake hands and hug each other yet. We aren't quite there at that place yet. But how do we go back to a place of greater compassion for one another? I wanted to start with talking about a few reasons why I think we are not doing so well at, at compassion right now. Some of the things that I think help explain that for us. And first of all, I think... All of us are just overwhelmed by our own grief and fear from a year of living in a pandemic, a fear of not knowing what's happening next, not knowing if we're safe or our family is safe and our loved ones, not knowing what's going to happen in our society next. We've also had a year of social and political unrest 
and protests in the street. We've had some, as I mentioned, horrific, uh, brutal hate crimes and killings that have happened and riots and uh, very upsetting social social disruption that has taken place that we're also living with and and wondering wondering am i really safe in my community are my loved ones safe safe from illness safe also from danger safe from hatred from other people and so i think this grief and fear that is overwhelming to us is just causing us to pull inward more to to go inside ourselves a little bit more, uh, to move toward self-survival and self-protection rather than putting ourselves in a place of being vulnerable or taking any risks with other people. Secondly, I think that we may have forgotten for a while that we're all connected to one another. We human beings, we're all one species here on this planet. We're all connected. We're all made up of the same type of DNA. We have so much more in common with one another than separates us, but we forget that all the time. We focus only on the differences between us and other people. And in fact, even the fact that that we talk about us and them and others is a sign of the fact that we don't feel connected. We don't feel that we are are all one. And that is a detriment to us. Because in fact, we are all connected. And we're also interdependent. We're part of this great ecosystem on this planet. We're, we're also all connected to nature, and on all living beings on this planet. And when we don't see ourselves as part of that connection, we don't remember that everything we do and say, has an impact on all other life on this planet. So forgetting our connections and our interdependence is a, a one of the ways that we forget to be kind. We forget to be compassionate. We focus on taking care of ourselves and forget that it matters how we show up in the world. It matters how we talk and how we think, how we dress, how we walk down the street, what we eat, how we greet other people, and how we show up in the world. And so that's something we have to remember is our connection with others and our interde interdependence. The third thing I think is that is that we have not been seeing the bigger picture of life in in the things that I write and in some things I've talked about in this podcast also. Um, I call it the galaxy view where we we look at life on this planet from a much bigger vantage point from the universe, not just from our own individual lives and what we're experiencing in life. When we look at that bigger picture, we can recognize that the universe is about something far bigger than just me. I'm here. I'm a component of it. I'm part of it. And and I'm important to all of it, but there's something much bigger happening in the universe, something much bigger about life, all of this life and matter that, that exists in our universe, something far bigger than I can even comprehend or understand. And that when I dwell only on my own tiny world, I sometimes think that whatever happens to me or whatever is going on in my life is the only thing that matters. And I forget that I'm part of something much bigger, much grander, much greater than just what's happening to me right now. And that bigger perspective is actually what I need to help me get through the difficulties of my day to day life. I think the fourth thing, the fourth reason we might be struggling with compassion right now is that we're not fully present in this moment. We may be acting out of old resentments that we've held on to from the past, old wounds, old disappointments and hurts and betrayals that we've carried with us. And those resentments can bubble up, especially when we're under stress like we are right now. And when there's a lot of trauma happening in our society, those old resentments can come up and can cause us to remember, oh, you know, I hate that group of people because of something that happened a long time ago. 
Also, we can be living too much in the future and too worried and scared about what the future might hold for us, worrying too much about what may come next, about the things we have no control over, things that haven't happened yet, the uncertainties of the future. So we can either be tied up in our resentments or our worries and possibly both, and we're completely missing the present moment. The reason the present moment is important is because the present moment is the only place where we can actually feel love and joy and creativity. The present moment is the only place where we can actually solve problems that are happening right now in the here and now. And when you can attend to the present moment and actually just keep your focus right here and and look at the world right now around you, you're much more likely to find beauty in the world. You're much more likely to see the joy that's around you and more likely to be able to bring love into the world. So when you can let go of the past resentments and stop worrying about the future, you can stay here in this moment and experience everything that this moment has to offer you. And then uh, the fifth reason that I wrote down, I'm sure there are many other reasons, but these are the five things I wanted to talk about today, is that I think we're struggling with compassion because, to be honest with you, we are primarily living from our egos rather than from our higher consciousness. And I wrote all about this in the book, The Journey from Ego to Soul. But one thing that happens when we are in a traumatic time and we're under a lot of stress, and indeed the entire planet is under stress right now, we tend to regress into a place of safety for us. And that happens to be in our lower consciousness where where we're in survival mode. We're worrying about what do I need for me? What's best for me? How do I take care of myself? Um, Focused on self-preservation. And living in that mode makes it much harder for us to activate compassion, which actually comes from our higher consciousness and our awareness that there's something greater. So I feel like we've all been pushed backward into maybe a more primitive state from our own development. Maybe some of us who uh, who have higher consciousness, we've learned about that. We've developed it in the past. We might even feel, feel ourselves being pulled backward into more isolation, more suspicion and fear, less trust, less love and less compassion. So uh, I, I have heard this from other people and even felt it myself, uh, that there are times when I feel too tired to care anymore. I can't do it. I'm too tired. I'm exhausted with everything that's been happening in the world. And I simply can't care. And that is a lack of compassion. But it's also a sign that we might be, we might be trying to send out empathy rather than compassion. And so I I thought it was important right here to talk about those two things and differentiate between them. Because in the book I mentioned to you, Compassion, Bridging Practice and Science, they actually did some research on empathy versus compassion. And they studied it Uh, with a functional MRI, they studied the neurobiology as well as the hormonal pathways in the brain uh, for people experiencing empathy and people experiencing compassion and found out that they have two completely different pathways. So uh, I want I'll talk about the differences between them and why it's important that we not be confused about them. Because Empathy from the meaning of the word is actually to be in the feeling of another, to actually be participating in the suffering of another person, to be feeling what that person is feeling. So that when we read the news every day, we might be feeling empathy for people in India, people all over our country, families who've had a a loved one die or had a loved one murdered by police, we might be feeling empathy for all of these groups of people and actually feeling the pain and the suffering that they are experiencing. And what the researchers found out are, is that when people are in a state of empathy, 
their body is very high in stress hormones because their body is experiencing it as if they themselves are going through exactly the suffering that they are are focusing on for other people. So they are feeling the stress and feeling the harm and the damage in a way of the pain of other people. They're taking it on personally and experiencing it. And so that type of empathy can be completely exhausting. It can deplete us. It can be bad for our health. And in this research study I read, they actually said they determined that when people experience burnout, burnout is not from having too much compassion for other people. It's from having too much empathy. And so empathy leads to uh, higher levels of stress hormones, as I say, and ultimately to to exhaustion. It fatigues our adrenal glands and our immune system can't function as well and can lead us into illness. So, so this is a really important dif- distinction to make and to understand, am I experiencing empathy for others or am I experiencing true compassion? And so the word compassion means to go with the suffering of another. And what's different about that is that um, in the definition of compassion that the research research researchers used, it includes being aware of the suffering of others, being able to look at it and to see it and to acknowledge that is happening, to also have a desire for others to be free from suffering, but to not take on the suffering, to not experience it in your own body, in a sense to be able to witness the suffering of others without becoming overly involved or overly emotional about the suffering that other people experience. When we're able to operate from pure compassion What the researchers found is that the vagus nerve is stimulated, which leads to a greater feeling of calmness and well-being within. So rather than being gradually destroyed by empathy for others, which kind of tears down our body, having compassion actually stimulates the vagus nerve, creates even more calmness within, and the secretion of helpful hormones like oxytocin and dopamine so that we can become even more relaxed and actually capable of even more compassion. There's this feedback loop. The more we experience compassion toward others, the more capable we are of being compassionate people, which is really interesting. And so it's so important that we can look at ourselves and say, right now, am I being compassionate? Or am I feeling empathy and allowing myself to be completely devastated by the information that I'm learning and figuring out how do I take one step back from empathy because compassion is actually set back a little bit. It's like looking on without getting involved. And that that might sound to us counterintuitive, like, wait, how can that be? I desire to end the suffering of other people, but it means that I don't take on responsibility for the suffering of other people. I don't assume that I myself have to fix the suffering of others. I am sending love and compassion and kindness and light into the situation of other people, but I'm not uh, trying to carry the pain on their behalf. And so I'm going to go back through the five things that I mentioned that I think are contributing to our failure at compassion right now and talk about how we can do those things differently. And so the first is we're overwhelmed by our own fear and grief from the pandemic. So for some of us, it might be we've been experiencing too much empathy for other people, feeling the suffering of the rest of the world too much within ourselves. It might just be that we've shut ourselves down and closed ourselves off. And so we're isolating ourselves and we're not able to find the connectedness that we need, which would help keep our hearts open. So the first step is that we need to learn to accept and be with difficult emotions. And this is what resilience is and coping. 
But we need to have practices like mindfulness that can help us discover greater equanimity in our own lives and peace. Mindfulness is really good at helping us witness our own emotions, look at our own fear, look at our grief, look at our pain, but not be overwhelmed by it, to be able to sit with it and allow it to be there without constantly trying to be rid of it. So uh, there's one little poem I wanted to read here, Compassion by Miller Williams. Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems conceit, bad manners, or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. And in that poem, I love that he's emphasizing compassion can actually be be something that we can feel for people that we don't know, that we're, we're not even acquainted with, people that we pass in the street, people that we see, people we hear about or read about. We can feel compassion for them. And I'm talking about even the people that behave in reprehensible ways, people that are doing things that we disagree with that we think are awful, that we think that we can't figure that out. Why would anyone act that way or talk that way or treat someone else that way? We don't understand it, yet we can still have compassion for those people. And as Miller Williams point out, they may be experiencing wars inside of themselves that we cannot imagine. And they may be carrying pain that we don't understand. So a part of this idea is that we need to learn how to find compassion even for people who repulse us by their behavior. And that sounds really hard, but I'm not saying that we need to learn to try to fix people that we disagree with. No, we actually need to stay back a step and simply send love to those people. Send love and compassion and kind thoughts their way knowing that they are likely struggling with something that we don't understand and we may never know about. So that's challenging. That's really challenging. But that's really important that we learn how can we open our heart to other people who are different from us. Can we see what we have in common with them? Can we acknowledge what the, what differences are there, but not be completely repulsed and pushed away by the differences. But remember that we are connected and remember that we are all dependent on one another. So that's dealing with the second issue I talked about, that we forget that we're all connected. We forget that we're interdependent. So by opening our heart to everyone, even those who are different, even those who offend us in many ways because of the differences between us to stop judgment and simply send kindness, send love and compassion toward, toward that other person. That's ultimately what compassion is. I'm, I don't need to fix that person. I don't need to figure out what's wrong with them or why they think the way they do. I don't even need to know what their wounds are and what pain they're carrying, but I can still have compassion. Whatever they're going through in their day, I send them love. Um, may they, may they have a better day. May they find some opening in their own heart. May they find love somehow today. The third, um, issue that I mentioned is not seeing the bigger picture. And so mentioning that's the universe is about something far bigger than us, something beyond our contem or beyond our comprehension. And one of the ways that I think that we do that is to spend time every day in contemplation on that very fact that there is something bigger going on here. And I need to relax within that. I need to relax as um, a speck in the universe and uh, 
relax in the in the uncertainty and in the not knowing of what will happen next and what's coming and be able to look at life from different perspectives. It isn't really just how I see it. There are many different ways of looking at what's happening on uh, on our planet right now. And uh, maybe if it, it can be awfully hard sometimes to take the perspective of another person who's different from you, but maybe um, just for an exercise, you could look at what is life on our planet like from the perspective of a pine tree that's growing in the park down the street from me? What is life like from the perspective of a dolphin swimming in the ocean right now? And, and maybe if you practice trying to to see things differently from those perspectives of something you don't feel um, emotionally negative about, it can help you at some point to begin to take the perspective of other people and how they might be seeing and feeling about what's happening in the world right now. And I have another poem that is titled The Way It Is by William Stafford. And William is talking about, I believe, about this idea of when you contemplate life from various perspectives, you come back always to yourself and to looking at what matters to you. What do you value in life and what are you really about? What is really important to you? What is truth to you? And come back always to holding on to your own truth. So William Stafford writes, there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding, but you don't ever let go of the thread. And when I read that poem, I think of the thread as being love, loving kindness, compassion, that for me, that is the thread that I try always to hold on to no matter what else is happening in the world, no matter what is changing around me, no matter what tragedy occurs, no matter what suffering there is, no matter what pain I experience, I try to always, always hold on to the thread. That thread of love is the one thing that doesn't fail me. It doesn't let me down. It's always there for me. I can count on it and it always shows me the way. It always guides me to a place where I can see something bigger or something higher. So I'm I'm suggesting that you have your own form of contemplation that helps you find the thread for your life. What is it that helps you stay the course, that keeps you centered, that keeps you on track, that you can always come back to and remember and, and remember what, what, what you value in the world, what matters more than anything else in your life. And as I said, for me, it's love. And I don't know what it is for you, but that's an important thing to contemplate because when you know what your thread is, that becomes your foundation. That's what keeps you stable no matter how much things are changing around you. And that's what allows you to cope better and be more resilient with these ups and downs of life. And so I also talked about not being fully present in the moment, partly because of too many old resentments from the past coming up or worries about the future. And to cope with that reality, we really have to practice forgiveness. We have to learn how to let go of what wounds we are carrying and hurts we're carrying from the past. I've done other podcasts on forgiveness and I will do more. I plan to have more conversations about forgiveness in the future because it's such an important step that we need to take. But forgiveness is actually one of the steps toward greater compassion. So if if we find that a lot of resentment and pain is coming up toward a certain person or a group of people toward something that happened in the past, it's a sign that 
We need to work on forgiveness. And when we can find our way to forgiveness, we will also find our way to greater compassion. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time because forgiveness deserves hours of conversation here, not just a few minutes. But um, forgiveness is not letting someone off the hook for anything that they've done wrong. Um, Forgiveness is simply deciding that I'm not going to continue to abuse myself over something that someone else did to hurt me in the past. I'm going to release it and let go of that and allow karma or nature or God or whatever happen for that person, allow them to experience their own consequences for whatever they did in the past. And I'm going to move forward with my own life without carrying such a heavy load of baggage and, and find my way once again through forgiveness back to greater compassion in my life. And so similarly, uh, we need to let go of our worries about the future. And that happens again, I think, through mindfulness and through really agreeing with ourselves that I honestly cannot spend my energy worrying about something that hasn't happened yet. That's such a meaningless activity for me to spend my time and my thoughts and and my energy in that way. So I'm just simply going to stop myself when I go into a worry mode and pull myself back from it. I don't have enough bandwidth to worry about what will happen next week, next month, next year. I just don't have that. I need to be here in this moment right now because there are things happening around me right now. This is where I want my attention. This is where I want my heart and my energy. And this is where I want to cultivate love and compassion right here in the present moment. So forgiveness and learning to be more present are essential for us in order to develop more compassion. And then finally, I talked about uh, the problem of living from our ego too much in self-preservation, self-survival mode, which is what going through a traumatic time causes us to do. It's a reaction in order to stay safe and in order to make sure that we're okay and the people we love are okay. But I think it's time that we can begin to move away from that self-preservation a little bit and move more toward higher consciousness and toward this act of compassion. And to accomplish this, it's really important that we develop a compassion practice, that we intentionally seek compassion because all the research that's been done shows that we can develop our ability to be compassionate. And uh, we, we lay down new, new neural pathways in the brain and we can strengthen those over and over again. And a number of, of studies have been done where they had people practice compassion um, for seven to eight weeks at a time. It made a huge difference for those people, uh, not only emotionally and mentally, spiritually, but also in their physical health when they practice compassion on a regular basis. So I want to suggest as we go into this, that first we work on self-compassion. And uh, I think, I think we've all talked about these kinds of thoughts before that you can't really love someone else if you don't love yourself. Um, Like on the airplane, put your own oxygen mask on first um, before you try to help someone with theirs. Um, Self-compassion, I think, is essential. We have to learn, how do I forgive myself for uh, any old resentment and negative thoughts I'm holding on to about myself? And so a lot of research has been done from the book I read also on self-compassion and the, uh, the value that it has for us in terms of healing ourself, ourselves and then raising our own consciousness. So one of the uh, studies that I read suggested just four steps like a a little four-step mantra that you can repeat for yourself as part of a self-compassion practice. So anytime you start to feel guilty or ashamed or feel some self-loathing or just feel bad about yourself or down because of something that happened or something that you did when when those negative emotions are starting to take you over, 
um, you can just repeat these four little sayings. And I think this is a really beautiful little self-compassion mantra. Um, first is to say, this is a moment of suffering. And just acknowledge it. This is a time. I'm feeling suffering. There's suffering around me, suffering within me, and feeling suffering. Number two, suffering is a part of life. Yes, it is. And that's the acceptance that we need to have, that suffering always happens. It will always be there. It will come back over and over again. And number three, may I be kind to myself in this moment. That's a huge and powerful wish and blessing for, for ourselves when we are feeling bad about something. May I be kind to myself in this moment. And number four, may I give myself the compassion I need. So again, those four are, this is a moment of suffering. Suffering is a part of life. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the compassion I need. And this comes from the mind, Mindful Self-Compassion program. They developed um, this little activity for self-compassion. But I really love that. I love having a practice like this, that every time you start to feel yourself crashing and um, cr crashing in on yourself and hating yourself, regretting that you did something, wanting to swear at yourself or yell at yourself because something went wrong, you made a mistake, someone else judged you or laughed at you or you simply failed to get something done that you wanted to do anytime those self recriminating and self loathing thoughts arise in your mind, say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. Suffering is a part of life. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the compassion I need. I, I just think that's really beautiful. And I think that uh, self-compassion is probably not something that we talk about that much in our society. We talk a lot about self-esteem. And that's something also that researchers told us self-esteem is actually very different from self-compassion because self-esteem tends to be eco-based and focuses on accomplishments or being better than other people. Whereas self-compassion is much more higher consciousness based and focusing on just accepting ourselves as we are and al allowing ourselves to be flawed, allowing ourselves to make mistakes and finding a way to love ourselves anyway. So self-compassion is a great coping tool in life and probably something all of us need to be practicing right now and forget about self-esteem. I think I think healthy self-esteem will come if we practice enough self-compassion. We don't even need to try to focus on self-esteem. That will follow on its own. But self-compassion is essential because it's a, it's a proactive practice that can help us grow in our ability to be compassionate towards ourselves and then from there to be compassionate toward others. So in addition to a self-compassion practice, it's also helpful to utilize the loving kindness meditation as a practice that can help you become more compassionate toward others and, and to yourself as well. But uh, loving kindness meditation is a Buddhist tradition also called Metta, M-E-T-T-A. And, um, this meditation has actually been studied fairly well. I read, and it's in the the uh, book I mentioned on compassion. And in the studies that they did with loving kindness, they had participants come for a, a one hour long training on loving kindness meditation once a week for seven weeks. And they were also given uh, MP3s they could listen to for guided meditations on loving kindness during the week if they chose to, they were encouraged to. But the main part of the study, they were these weekly hour long trainings. And at the end of the seven week trainings, they found that those who participated in the loving kindness meditation had more positive emotions, uh, more social connectedness, and improved physical health and a greater ability for compassion also as well. So 
the loving kindness meditation is really powerful. And, and I'll remind you again, all these people did was attend a training and then sit at home and practice loving kindness. And so loving kindness, once again, it, it's something we do from a distance, like compassion. You don't necessarily have to be in the moment serving other people, um, hands on helping other people. You can practice loving kindness and compassion from your own home. And, um, <clears throat> and it can be, uh, powerfully effective for you and for other people. So Jack Cornfield uh, has recommended a loving kindness meditation that I'm going to repeat for you here. I have shared one that I use and have been using for years in the past, but I want to share the one that Jack Cornfield recommends right now as something a little bit different to offer to you. Um, and his has four statements. First, you repeat it for yourself. So again, going back to self-compassion, the four statements are, may I be filled with loving kindness. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be well in body and mind. May I be at ease and happy. So you begin the practice by saying this blessing for yourself over and over again during a time when you're practicing meditation or just sitting quietly until you begin to feel that inner peace and feel calm and feel at ease inside. And when you feel ready, you can begin to say the blessing for other people. You can choose a person to focus on or a group of people. Um, you might be at a place where you could just focus on sending it out to the whole world if you wanted to. But for some in the beginning, it's easier to picture a person that you would like to send loving kindness to. And then you change these to you statements. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. May you be well in body and mind. May you be at ease and happy. So that simple blessing is the type that they used in the research that was done. And by sitting at home and repeating that and focusing on certain people or groups of people, or as I said, you can even focus on the entire universe if you want to, sending out this loving kindness to them. You change your own physiology and you actually begin to change the world around you. You can change the world in these little ripples because the more you practice this, the more from your own heart, you will feel compassion for others. When you go out into the world and when you hear someone speaking negatively or you see someone who scares you a little or someone that you just don't understand and you, and you can't figure out who are they? What are they doing? How do they think this way? Instead of going into your mind and feeling fear uh, and withdrawal from that other person, you can go into your heart. You will automatically go into your heart and simply find a way to experience love and loving kindness for those people. And when you hear the news and when you read something on social media that is disturbing and upsetting, you can go into your heart and you can experience loving kindness and you can send it directly from your heart to the people that are involved for the situations that are happening for the pain that is there. And I swear to you, because of this factor that we're all connected and we're all interdependent, and this is a vast universe, and we know that energetically everything in this universe is connected you don't have to go to a place where people are suffering and put bandages on those people. You don't have to pick up their burdens and carry them on your own back. You can be in your place where you are sending your love to people everywhere who need it and you can make an impact. It will ripple out from you and make a difference to other people. I want you to believe that and know that because that's what I think true compassion is when you, you can read about, in fact, you want to read about, you want to know what suffering is happening in the world so that you know where to direct your compassion and your loving kindness. You're willing to look at suffering. You're willing to be present with it, willing to see it 
to acknowledge it, to know it's there and it's terrible and it's so painful. It's so hard. But you are willing in that moment to take all of that, all of that suffering and pain you've seen and immediately go into your heart and cultivate the beautiful compassion and loving kindness that you've been practicing and send it out. Everywhere you see pain and darkness and hatred, send out this light and beautiful loving kindness and compassion that you've been working to develop. And that's honestly how we can make an impact and change the world right now at a time when many of us feel we can't physically get involved in the causes we would like to be part of. We can't engage in the world in the way we wish we could, the way we would like to. And so to remind you of the power of the simplest bit of kindness or compassion, uh, whether you're sending it from your heart or whether perhaps through your eyes lighting up through a smile on your face, if you're able to go without a mask now, um, I want you to remember that you can change someone else's life and you can change what's happening for them and how they see the world in a moment. And I have one last beautiful poem to share with you that I'm going to end with today. It's titled At the Corner Store by Allison Luderman. He was a new old man behind the counter, skinny, brown, and eager. He greeted me like a long-lost daughter, as if we both came from the same world, someplace warmer and more gracious than this cold city. I was thirsty and alone, sick at heart, grief-soiled, and his face lit up as if I were his prodigal daughter returning, coming back to the freezer bins in front of the register, which were still and always filled with the same old cable car ice cream sandwiches and cheap frozen greens. Back to the knobs of beef and packages of hot dogs, these familiar shelves strung with potato chips and corn chips, stacked up beer boxes and immortal Jim Beam. I lumbered to the case and bought my precious bottled water, and he returned my change, beaming as if I were the bright new buds on the just bursting open cherry trees, as if I were everything beautiful struggling to grow. And he was blessing me as he handed me my dime over the counter and the plastic tub of red licorice whips. This old man, who didn't speak English, beamed out love to me in the iron week after my mother's death, so that when I emerged from his store, my whole cockeyed life, what a beautiful failure, glowed gold like a sunset after rain. Frustrated city dogs were yelping in their yards, mad with passion behind their chain-link fences, and in the driveway of a peeling paint house, a woman and a girl danced to contagious reggae. Praise Allah, Jah, the Buddha, Kuan Yin, Jesus, Mary, and even jealous old Jehovah. And so on that note, with that beautiful thought, may you be the person who can beam out love to someone who is in pain. May you change their entire life with a smile, with a thought, with just simply the brightness of the love that emanates from you. May you feel well and healthy and whole. May you know how beautiful you are. May you forgive yourself for any failures and any flaws that you are carrying with you. And may you be able to be this amazing presence in the world, holding on to the thread of love and compassion always, and able to share it wherever it's needed at any time. I thank you so much for joining me here for this today. I hope you'll come back next week for the next episode. And until then, remember, we're here for love. So face your fears. Be ready for whatever kind of suffering life brings your way next. And love each and every moment 
of your beautiful life. Bye-bye.